Their Satanic Majesty's Request was recorded and released by the Rolling Stones back in early December of 1967. Released roughly six months after the Beatles' release of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, many critics have compared it unfavorably to Sgt. Pepper, calling it derivative and an example of the Rolling Stones copying the Beatles. While I understand this criticism, and while this is certainly not my favorite Rolling Stones album, I find it unjust to point a finger and cry copycat. Personally, I never got to experience the musical cultural phenomenon that was Sgt. Pepper when it happened, but I have read enough to realize that its release had an enormous influence on the musical culture of the time. Upon its initial release, Pepper blew away the Beatles' musical contemporaries. Jimi Hendrix was so impressed that he covered the Sgt. Pepper title track just days after its release. Brian Wilson wanted to outdo the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper album with Smile, the legendary lost concept album that wouldn't see the light of day until decades later. And it feels to me that the general feeling in the air was that the Beatles had shown that anything was possible and that you could use the studio as an instrument to experiment and go beyond just the four to five piece band setup. So in regards to the Stones, I get the feeling that they, like a lot of other bands during that time, weren't so much trying to copy the Beatles as they were trying to say, hey, look what the Beatles did. Let's see what we can do. The album opens with Sing This All Together. This is actually a really good folk rock song. It has a very grandiose opening, though, that wants to tell you that something epic is about to begin before it breaks into the song's very catchy opening chorus. At about the 1 minute and 33 mark, it breaks into what is clearly an improvised jam, but it's a jam session that works. It's one of those lucky moments during this album where the jam session feels focused and on point. Some of the later jam sessions won't be quite so on point, but we'll get to those in a moment. Not even one breath of rest is given when the band moves into track two entitled Citadel, proving that the Stones could do psychedelia as well as anyone else. So far, their Satanic Majesty's request is shaping up to be a very worthy response to Sgt. Pepper from a band with a very different musical point of view. But at the 2 minute and 27 mark, it almost feels like the track, which has so far been mostly solid, is about to derail. Luckily, the song starts to fade out. Track 3, In Another Land, is a melodically sound track, but I'll be honest. I find the underwater vibrato effect on Bill Wyman's voice to be a bit annoying. In spite of my annoyance with the vibrato effect on the vocals, I can hear past it. I can hear that this is a good song with a good melodic structure. This is until, of course, we are treated to about 15 seconds or so of what I've read is Charlie Watts snoring. Frank Zappa knows how to pull off this sort of thing, but not the Rolling Stones. And this is where some of the album's fraying at the seams begins to show. 15 seconds of hearing Charlie Watts snore is enough to make me grateful for the next track, 2000 Man. I have briefly discussed this track in an episode of Remake Rumble, but I am anxious to get to talk about it in a bit more detail here. 2000 Man is a good song, but on this recording the execution is off. The opening folk guitar intro is nice enough, but its transition from intro to opening verse feels jarring, as if not everyone in the band was completely sure as to where the song is going next. This continues when the song transitions from first chorus to second verse at the 53 second mark. Throughout this whole section, Charlie Watts's drums feel at odds with the rest of the band. The song's arrangement sounds awkward until about the 1 minute and 20 second mark when it comes to an abrupt halt. Then it breaks into the Oh Daddy, Proud of Your Planet section, and it's as if the song finds its groove suddenly. It almost feels like it's going to lose its groove at the 1 minute and 40 second mark during the transition to Oh Daddy Your Brain Still Flashing section, but no, it lifts up the bar and beefs up the groove, making it even stronger. So the song has found a solid groove, and it should have stayed there, in that groove. 
instead of changing tempo and switching back to what is basically a slightly more rocked version of its folk intro. Once again, I can tell that 2000 Man is a good song at its core. And tempo changes can be great if you do them right. But they weren't being done right here, and someone needed to be producing in the studio to pull the reins on this one and say, hey, you guys got a good song here, but this part works and this part doesn't. Make the rest of it sound like the part that works. With just one song away from the end of side one, their Satanic Majesty's request has begun to derail a bit, but it will then start to derail even more with the next track. Side one's closing track is entitled, Sing This All Together, parentheses, See What Happens, and parentheses. And what exactly does happen? Well, unfortunately, not much. You hear someone ask, where's that joint? And then the song proceeds to evolve into a jam session that is the antithesis of the jam session from the album's opening track. To be fair, there is a moment at the 2 minute and 10 second mark where it feels like it's going to get some focus, only to lose it again at about the 2 minute and 23 second mark. And this jam session goes on for close to 8 minutes. At about the 7 minute mark, the track returns back to the melody and theme of Sing This All Together. Now, I personally love this darker, reverb drenched rendition. And it's a shame that we had to slog through seven minutes of what is mostly musical rambling to get to it. And I wish that this rendition had been extended a bit as well. In fact, if I could have been in the room, I would have suggested that they start with this darker, more reverb-drenched rendition. And then let it lead into the jam session. And then close that jam session with that same version of Sing This All Together. Of course, I would have also hoped for a better improv jam, but even with the jam session that is on the album, the track would have come off as more cohesive if they had just bookended the opening and closing with Sing This All Together. This brings us to the end of side one and takes us to the beginning of side two uh, with track six entitled She's a Rainbow. Now, most of us are used to the radio edit version of this song, but the album gives us some very cool spacey sound textures first, and I do like this part. But I could do without the spoken word segment that follows. It sounds like a, uh, a carnival uh, announcer m talking about some sort of carnival game and trying to get people to play. I think the track would have moved better if the spoken word part were just simply deleted. And we are going to get some more spoken word at the album's end as well, so I don't think we need it here. But now, let's discuss the actual track itself. She's a Rainbow is the Rolling Stones emulating the Beatles. Notice I didn't use the word copy. And they emulate them wonderfully in this song. This is the Stones basically saying, hey mates, we can do your shtick, but we are going to put our own spin on it. Just as John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote, I want to be your man for the Rolling Stones, the Rolling Stones could have easily written She's a Rainbow for the Beatles to record. And to be honest, um, to me it's always been a shame that the Beatles didn't record a rendition. would have loved to have heard it, but that's one of my flights of fancy. Um, this is, of course, a beautiful, melodic bit of pop that gets every single note, every single la-la-la exactly right. And I love the really wicked sense of musical humor that the Rolling Stones throw in at the end of the song with the violins uh, that are not really played so much as they are just simply wanked around with. I always smile and even chuckle a bit when I hear this part. Track 7 starts with the tolling of bells and the opening chords of The Lantern. The dark and upbeat opening chords of this song intro is so strong that it's a shame they brought it to a halt and shifted musical gears after the introduction. I kind of wish they had set that opening aside and developed it into another song. However, though, what follows the intro is just as good. To me, the lantern kind of foreshadows the stones that we soon start to experience with albums like Let It Bleed and Beggar's Banquet. I am surprised that this track doesn't get more notice. 
at the two minute and 22 second mark, there is a sonically wonderful musical interlude that is just beautiful. This song definitely deserves more attention. Next is track eight, The Gomper. As to why this song is called The Gomper is anyone's guess. The track starts melodically well enough during its introduction, but starts to veer into incohesiveness once we start moving into the verse, and about a minute in, the track starts to become melodically disjointed, and by the two minute mark is moving into the same problems that track five had as we move into another disjointed instrumental jam session. There are some melodic elements about the gomper that are worth salvaging, but sadly, most of them are in the song's introduction. This brings us to track nine, 2,000 Light Years From Home. Along with She's a Rainbow, 2,000 Light Years From Home is easily one of the best songs on the album. The song opens with some very expressive fixed piano effects before launching into the track proper, and suddenly the album, their satanic majesty's request, reaches its true psychedelic potential. Apparently, Mick Jagger wrote the song's lyrics while he was doing jail time. Apparently, his only crime was ingesting drugs at a party, and the outlook at the time was bleak for him and that he might spend many years in prison for it. So the song's dark and fearful lyrics revolving around loneliness, alienation, and isolation are understandable. At about the 2 minute and 13 second mark, there is some guitar riffing that I can only refer to as sounding very proto-metal. I will assume it's Keith Richards playing this rather than Brian Jones, but if anyone has any inside info on this, I will appreciate getting a comment about it. 2000 Light Years From Home is a stunning bit of dark psychedelia, and it's kind of a shame that they didn't just end the album with it. Instead, we end with the much more anticlimactic On With The Show. I personally see this track as the Rolling Stones take on Paul McCartney. Songs like When I'm 64, Your Mother Should Know, and even later solo works like You Gave Me The Answer reflect McCartney's love for old-style Tin Pan Alley songs, and I feel like this is the Stones doing their take on that style. On With The Show is not a terrible track by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, it's a pretty good track and might have worked better placed earlier in the album's track listing. In fact, it might have made a stronger closing for side one than what was used. Think about this for a moment. After 2000 Man, we close side one with On With The Show. Side two closes with 2000 Light Years From Home. But before it fades out, we fade into the darker, eerie reprise of the album's opening track, Sing This All Together. Since this song now bookends the entire album, we then retitle the album, Sing This All Together. Why don't we sing this song all together? Open our heads, let the pictures come. And if we close our eyes all together, then we will see where we all come from. Once again, think about it. The album has asked us to sing the opening track all together, thus opening our heads and letting the pictures come. The rest of the album's tracks are now the pictures. And at the end of the album, when the song is reprised, we are at the end of the journey, and just maybe we have seen where we all come from. Just a thought. This is TJR, and for this review, I have read very little new background material on this album's creation, and instead I just went with how the music hit me as I listened to it. Any historical references that I have referred to during this review was information that I already knew. I started to write this review before the 50th anniversary edition of the album was available and before I was able to get a copy of the Rolling Stones in mono. Since I started this review by listening only to the stereo version of the album that has been widely available, and since this is the version that most fans have, I felt it was important to finish it with this version as my guide. I am planning on listening to the new stereo remaster that has been made for the recent 50th anniversary deluxe edition, and also the mono mix for both the recent 50th anniversary release and the Rolling Stones and mono box set. If I feel that it really makes any difference in how I feel about any of the album at all, I will be doing a follow-up video to discuss that as well. 
So please stay tuned and click subscribe. And don't forget to click the bell icon after you click subscribe so that you can receive notifications as to when I am releasing new videos. Thanks everybody for watching. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about this album and this review in the comments section. Take care everybody. Bye-bye.